So this morning, we're going to be going back to the book of Acts, back to our picking up with our, with our viral study, our, our study in the stories in the book of Acts. The last time, two weeks ago, when we were in Acts, we left off right in the middle of a story about Peter and Cornelius. Peter and, and Cornelius is Roman centurion in the city of, in the city of Caesarea. What happened there, we kind of left things hanging. What happened there is we see this scene where, where Cornelius, a Roman centurion, a Gentile, receives this vision from God, this angel, and receives this message to go and seek out, to search, to look for this man named Peter. Peter, on the other hand, was in many ways, I kind of, you know, uh, you know I, I kind of insert this or, or imagine this on my own. Peter was in this town of Joppa. We do know he was in Joppa, but I imagine he was in Joppa not because he was there as part of a mission, not because he was there as part of ministry work, but because he was there and trying to, in a sense, get away. He was on vacation. He was taking a retreat. He was planning to stay, to kind of stay out of the limelight. At this point, the church is still centered around the city of Jerusalem, and Joppa was about two to three days journey from from Jerusalem. And so there's really no reason for Peter to be in Joppa unless he is in many ways trying to get away and refresh. But while he's there, even though his plan was to, to refresh and to re-energize for the mission and the ministry that was going on in Jerusalem, God had other plans. And in the midst, while, while Peter was there, about the same time that Cornelius up in Caesarea had a vision, Peter also had a vision. And in Peter's vision, he sees this sheet coming down out of heaven filled with all sorts of unclean animals according to the Jewish law. And he hears this voice, presumably the voice of God, saying to Peter, Peter, get up, kill these animals and eat. It's okay. And Peter is offended. He says, no way am I going to do this. I'm not going to break these kosher laws. I'm not going to eat something that you have clearly said I shouldn't eat. And so Peter's confused by this. He doesn't know what to make of it. And in the midst of all he's thinking about, he's starting to come out of this vision. He's starting to kind of, he's really thinking about it and mulling it over and trying to understand what exactly was all this about. What did this mean? And the spirit comes to him and says, Peter, there's three men downstairs and they're looking for you. It's okay. You're going to want to fight. You're going to want to resist. But I sent them. Go downstairs, meet them, and go with them. And so Peter goes downstairs, he meets these men, and he invites them into the, into the house where he himself was a guest at. That's where we left off that in two weeks ago. That's where we left off, and that's in many ways where we're picking up today. But that's before we go any further. Let's go ahead and spend a moment, take a moment to pray and ask for God's leading in our study this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you would just open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears as we dig into your word. Pray that you would open your word up to us, that we would receive it, that we would be challenged by it, and that we would come out on the other side strengthened and encouraged, prepared and equipped to go out into the world to be viral. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts chapter 10 is where we're going this morning, starting at about halfway through verse 23, because 23 kind of splits the difference. We ended with verse 23. We're picking up with verse 23 again. So Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 23. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea, and Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people, and he said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? So Peter goes into this house, he goes with these men, just as God had commanded him to do through the Spirit, and he gets to Caesarea, and he, go, and he arrives at Cornelius' house, and he meets Cornelius. And the first thing Cornelius does is he falls down at Peter's feet, almost worshiping him, almost like a god himself. And in many ways, this is kind of like a little hangover from Cornelius' Gentile, from his Roman, from his Greek upbringing, with all these Roman gods that were more kind of this half-god, half-human type figure in Cornelius' younger years in his childhood. He treats Peter in many ways in much that same way. 
Yes, Peter is a man to be respected. Yes, Peter has this reputation, or Cornelius assumes he's got this reputation as a spiritual leader, but he thinks the appropriate response is to bow down and treat Peter like a god. And Peter says, hold on a second. I'm just a normal man. I'm not God. I'm not God. I am just a normal man. Get up. Do not worship me. Do not bow down to me in that way. And Peter walks into the house and gets into the house and he finds that Cornelius is being the ultimate in church planter, the ultimate missionary. He's invited all of his close friends and all of his relatives together. And so you have this house packed full of people anxiously awaiting to see Peter and to hear what Peter has to say. And he walks into this house and the first thing Peter says, he says, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. You're well aware that it's against our law. Peter, the way he talks about it, the wording he uses, sends the message that this is biblical law. This comes straight out of the Bible. This comes from God himself. God himself has prohibited his people, has prohibited Jews from associating with, from visiting, from being anywhere in the close proximity with a non-Jew. The reality is that this really isn't law. This was more like Pharisaic tradition. This comes from the Pharisees, and, and, and one of the things about the Pharisees is when they did stuff, when they developed these traditions and these ideas, they basically became treated as laws. And so what this does, means is that one, Peter has been, like many Jews, has been affected and influenced by Pharisaic tradition, but he's come to treat many of this stuff as law. And so he walks into this room, and there's a part of him that thinks, I shouldn't be here. Simply by walking into the room, simply by being around these people, is making me unclean. And in Judaism, when you are unclean, it means you are barred from worshiping God. In Judaism, when somebody... So Peter, as the leader of the early church, is going into a situation that in his mind means, I can't associate with God anymore. I have to go and I have to do this sacrifice and this ritual and i got to you know, go through this ba- bath or whatever it is. got to change my clothes and wait so many days. Then I will be allowed to worship God. The problem is, is that he's here because God told him to go here. There's a tension that starts to develop here. There's a tension that starts to be created here because Peter knows he's supposed to be here because of what God said, but he's not supposed to be here because of what the law is. And there's this tension that develops, and he wrestles with that. Now, one hand, because he went along with these men who came and sought him out two weeks ago, there's a sense that he's starting to kind of figure this out. And even in our text, even to a certain extent, it kind of suggests that down at the, uh, in, uh, in verse 28, the last half of verse 28. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. In a sense, Peter is starting to show that he's starting to figure this out. He's starting to move beyond the fact of seeing this vision before being just about food to having a bigger spiritual significance. Now it's not just about food, it's about all clean and unclean things. It's about everything, including people. But on one end, you can see he's still wrestling with this. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made the comment. Otherwise, he wouldn't have walked in. The first thing he says is, it's illegal for me to be here. There's a tension here, and I really want to drive home that tension because we may not as a church, be wrestling with who can be a Christian and who cannot. We may not necessarily be wrestling anymore with the idea of, you know, do you have to be a certain ethnicity? Do you have to be a certain race? Do you have to speak a certain language? Do you have to be from a certain tribe or a certain, you know, I I don't know, a certain tradition or drive a certain car to be a Christian? We may not be wrestling with that, but there are still things that we wrestle with. There are still things that come out in the same way. There is still the tension that exists here. And I know, I've heard many stories lately about some of the things that have happened with this church between schooling options. I promise I do not know names. I have not heard anything specific or anything like that. But there is a reality that based on on our tradition, the tradition that we have in our denomination of endorsing and supporting Christian education, I know there have been questions that have been raised in the past about why do we do things like reach out to Bancroft Elementary, a public school? Should we be supporting public education in any way? There's a tension that starts to develop when we look at these, when we look at these things. This is just an example. But hear me on this. Please hear me on this. 
Christian education is a good thing. Christian schools are good things. The traditions that we have in our denomination, the habits, the patterns that we've developed over the years are good things. I'm not going to shut those down, but those things should never be something that prevents us or keeps us from going out into community, for blessing others, for using what we have been blessed with to bless the community around us in any way and every way we possibly can. The things that we have, these, these, these rules, these walls that we sometimes build up around ourselves should never be something that prevents the gospel from being spread or preached to everyone. There is a tension that exists there in our life. Maybe it's not schools. Maybe it is cars. Maybe it does depend on, you know, do you drive a white car or a black car? Do you drive an American-made car or a foreign-made car? Maybe it has to do with jobs or certain jobs. Do we think of certain jobs as being more holy than others? Maybe it has to do with what movies we watch or what books we read. But there is, in every group and even within us in this group here, there are tension points that exist, that in many ways act, and, and we treat them much the way Peter does here when he walks into this room full of Gentiles. Is it okay for Peter to be here? Is it okay for him to even associate with these people? Will God still accept him? Or is it just downright wrong and sinful? There's a tension that exists in our text. Verse 30. Cornelius answered, Three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. So but before, when Peter first arrives at Cornelius' house, he's a, little bit, he's a little bit uneasy, he's a little bit wobbly still. It's like, okay, it seems like, because of what I'm experiencing, what I'm seeing, it seems like God is telling me that Gentiles are okay, that it's okay for me to associate with this group, even though I know what the law is, even though I might not be comfortable. It seems like he's kind of starting to move in that direction. And then once he asks why he's here, once he asks what the reason is that Cornelius sent for him, and he hears Cornelius' own story, then all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, Peter has corroboration. Now all of a sudden, he has verification that his suspicion that what he is thinking and the direction he's moving is accurate, that this really is something that comes from God. Because see, what happens with Cornelius, Cornelius, in receiving this vision and receiving this message directly from God or through an angel of God, this is something that Jews would say, this can't happen. God doesn't do this. God doesn't speak to Gentiles. God doesn't speak to this group over here. He only speaks to the circumcised. He only speaks to Jews because those are his real people. Those are his people, not the Gentiles. We are. And so when Peter hears a story from Cornelius about Cornelius' own vision, Peter now is faced with the reality that I can't deny this anymore. God is calling even Gentile, Gentiles to himself. And he says, or it's that, collaborate, it's that corroboration, it's that verification that we should be sent, zeroing in on here. Last week we spent a lot of time talking about our own unique calls as we were celebrating the start of a new ministry season and we were talking about those, those unique calls that we receive as individuals. What has God called us? What has he called you? What has he called me to do? And we thought a little bit about what the, how do we discern that and how do we figure that out? And one of the things I said is we look, at, we look at our talents. We look at the things we get passionate about. We look at the desires that maybe we have. What are these things that God has placed on our heart and how do we work that out? From my own story, I have always loved 
the Bible, and I've always loved theology. I told, you, I told you I'm a nerd. I've always been a nerd. I've always loved Bible and theology. I went to a Christian school. I excelled in my Bible classes. I hardly ever studied. While all my friends around me were freaking out about what does predestination mean, and how do you define it, and what is um, transubstantiation, and I mean, just all these big theological words. All I had to do was sit in class, not take notes, and it just stuck. And that was just something about me, and I loved doing it. It always came easy. I also loved being creative and building things. I never got into model making, but in high school, because of my desire to build things and design things and create things, I, I, I started taking, I took a couple drafting classes in high school. And I had this dream of graduating high school and going off to Cal Poly and enrolling in architectural engineering. But when it got to the point when I started to realize when I was on my third time through trying to pass algebra class, I started to realize I can't go into engineering because engineering takes a lot of math and I can't stand math. I hate math. I'm just not good at math. But I still had this desire to create and build things. And then through countless, I don't know, conversations and experiences, going on short-term mission trips, talking with teachers, talking with mentors, talking with other pastors, and having these experiences, putting my faith into action and serving in some way, I started to realize that, you know, I really think God's still kind of pushing me over in this direction of ministry. But then I thought, you know, ministry, I, I don't want to do ministry because it means going into a pre-existing church that already has their traditions and I can't build anything and I can't be creative and all that. So I went into church planting and I started off in church planting. I found a way to bring together my love of theology and biblical studies, my love of God with being creative and, being, and building something and developing something. And really it's that same desire, it's that same thing that brought me into church planting that brought me here when this position opened up, when I was approached here. Because I see the same thing here. I see an opportunity for us to grow, to develop, to strengthen in our mission and our ministry to the community of Wanna Creek. We asked this question last week, why did God put us here? It's been a repeat question that we need to keep wrestling with as we go through the book of Acts. And all of that, all of those things, and me arriving here at this point, and you arriving at the point that maybe you're at when you find that ministry, when you plug in somewhere, when you do something that you get joy from, it's happened because you've had all these different voices speaking into your life. You have these experiences and these people you respect that say, you're good at that. Or you look like you really enjoy that. And we figure out what God has called us to. We get that verification, that corroboration that comes from other voices. And Peter is getting that same thing. He's not too sure about what God is calling. He's not too sure about this open door to go to people that he thought were rejected by God. But when he starts realizing that God is moving in a whole bunch of different places in the same way, at the same time, he can't deny it. Ministry doors are opening. Verse 36, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How about, God, about how God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We were witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard him speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. 
So Peter goes on to give the basic gospel, gospel presentation, something that we have essentially seen many times already in the book of Acts. It covers all the same points that he has covered so many times, but he takes his context into account and he focuses on something a little different. Before, every time he's talked about this, he's always been talking to, his Jew, to a Jewish audience and Jewish believers, and he's really focused in on their guilt, their sin for what they did to Jesus, for rejecting the promised Messiah. But here, because he's talking to Gentiles, he focuses in on faith. Faith becomes that link. Faith becomes that point that brings Gentiles and Jewish believers together. That point that says that, that that thing that says that Gentiles are just as accepted as we are. There is no longer any difference. Verse 43 again, all the prophets testify about him, referring to Jesus, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It's all about the faith. And then something incredible happens. A Gentile Pentecost. Essentially, that's what happens because as Peter is speaking, as he's wrapping this up, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes down and it dwells in it, comes in and sits on top of and dwells in and, and, and makes its home inside these Gentiles. This isn't supposed to happen in Peter's mind. But it happens, and these Gentiles begin praising God, and they begin, begin just singing praises and glorifying God in the only way that they can and know how. It's spontaneous, and you can imagine it's a bit chaotic as this is all happening. And Peter says, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. They have been given the same benefit. They, are too, are being invited into the community. Now again, I've already acknowledged, for most of us, we probably don't really wrestle with who can be a Christian and who cannot. We're probably not wrestling with that question of who and what the qualifications are beyond faith. In many ways, what we're looking at here, this is, this is old news. This is stuff that we have heard so many times, that so many of us have heard so many times before. So what actually what I want to do is I actually want to point out something I think is going on sort of underneath the surface a little bit, but is still very much here, and it's this question of what is God capable of doing? What do we believe that God is actually capable of doing? Because as Peter was standing there and as the other circumcised believers were standing there and watching this, they were amazed and astonished because in their world, God doesn't do this. God is not capable of doing this. God is not able to do this. God is not willing to do this. This doesn't happen. See, we tend to, we tend, we tend to make a lot of boxes to build a lot of boxes. And usually we talk about putting people in the boxes, putting other people in the boxes. And, and those boxes, you know, they're mostly metaphorical, but sometimes and often they play out quite literally in that by putting a person in a box, we're saying, this is how that person is supposed to act. This is how they're supposed to live. This is how they're supposed to, to, to look. This is the stereotype of what that person is supposed to be like. And oftentimes, we also tend to put God in a box. We also tend to look at God and think to ourselves, you know, God, yeah, I kind of get this God, but God, you know, God doesn't do that stuff over there. God doesn't do this, or he doesn't want to do this, as though somehow or other we understand and we know God better than God knows himself. And so what we wrestle with, and the issue that kind of comes up here and that the, the Jewish believers are wrestling with is this idea of what does God do? What is he capable of doing? What is he able to do? What is he willing to do? Do we believe that God is able to take incredibly messy, imperfect people and use them for good? Do we believe that God is able to take those who, by all human accounts, are rejected by God to turn them around, transform them, and work out his mission through them? Do you believe that despite all your messiness and imperfection that you see every time you look in the mirror, that what happens at this table, what happens at the cross, which this table represents, actually does good? Do you believe that God, despite how many times you reject him and how many times you try to put him in a box, do you believe that you too were called, created, and equipped and transformed for God's glory. We're going to take communion here in a few minutes. 
And one of the things about communion, communion focuses on the cross. It focuses on the death of Jesus. A lot of times we think of communion as something that we do in which we remember the salvation we received, but it's not about the salvation we received. Communion is about the death and the washing and the cleansing and the transformation that took place on the cross. It's about a God who voluntarily made himself unclean so that we, so that you could be clean. Do not call anything unclean that I have made clean.